The Department of Labor has cut the expanded unemployment benefits after the COVID-19 pandemic, and those affected by Hurricane Ida are still holding out hope. A statue of Robert E. Lee dating back to 1890 is being removed by the state of Virginia, and five U.S. service members were declared dead after a helicopter crash. All of this and more right here on WCTV. You're watching WCTV Channel 14 News. I'm Gwen Napier. And I'm Caleb Yager. Students on campus may have noticed a change in the Stover Student Center. The closing of the bookstore came with an opening of a new building on campus. Riley Holsinger has more on the new campus hangout. The nest has swarmed onto the scene here as a new addition at Waynesburg University. Out is the bookstore and in is the nest. The bookstore is only virtual now, but some of the clothing made its way into the nest as well as some new additions. The nest is located at 84 Wayne Street. Student and faculty feedback played a role into the changes. We had over 300 surveys that were complete about what students wanted to see in the bookstore. Um, and we call it the bookstore actually kind of um, um, universally, but to be honest, we separate that now. We have the virtual bookstore and we have the campus store. And so it's in two functions. Exciting feedback has come from both faculty members and the students regarding the potential of the nest. I was really excited. I think it's a good addition to campus. I think so far the feedback has been great. Waynesburg apparel and items fill the nest full of black and burnt orange for people to buy for myself <laughs> or even for and my mom. <laughs> clothing and other goodies aren't the only plans for the nest moving forward. Upstairs we'll have a game room um, and those uh, the games that will be up there it'll be great hangout space for students um, to gather to have fun. The second floor of the nest with the game room will be called Rudy's Place to pay homage to the former Waynesburg basketball coach Rudy Marisa. Direct results owner Pam Marisa is related to coach Marisa and helped bring the idea of the nest into existence with the help of a former player of Marisa's. We have a wonderful connection um, with Coach Marisa, and actually uh, we also have involved in the relationship here and the um, ability for us to create this store, a, a former um, student athlete um, that was mentored by and played for Coach Marisa um, on the court and that actually wanted to contribute and help make this happen. So we have a wonderful um, story there that we'll be talking about during our grand opening and sharing more details about. The nest currently has a cornhole set outside of the front of the building for students to enjoy. More lawn game additions are also in the plans as well to display during the grand opening in October. We expect at that point um, we'll be able to see all of the things and talk more about the specifics of what you're going to see upstairs and what you'll see outside, which will be great. Reporting for Channel 14 News, I'm Riley Holsinger. The Waynesburg University Student Activity Board hosted the first coffee house of the semester. Reporting from the Beehive, here's Rebecca Vaughn. On Tuesday, August 31st, Waynesburg University students gathered in the Beehive to take part in the Student Activity Board's first coffee house of the fall semester. Hot and iced coffees, cookies, and supplies to make hot tea were available to students to enjoy while studying and relaxing with friends. And performing at this coffee house, Matt Skye, a former contestant on The Voice. Students enjoyed the time to relax and get work done with the free coffee and entertainment. You know, it's really nice that Waynesburg um, invites local artists, and I think that's really cool that they give them a platform. And I love the free coffee. Um, and also, the free mug is awesome, too. So, yeah, it was a really fun night. You heard that right. After an hour filled with music and talking, students were given free coffee mugs to enjoy more coffee at home. Hey, Waynesburg. My name is Matt Skye. Thank you so much for having me at the coffee house. Uh, it's been over a year now since I've gotten to play live at colleges, and um, you know it's really nice to come out. Great turnout tonight, and it was really nice to just play for people, meet new people, and uh, get back to it. So uh, thank you for having me, and uh, hope I'll see you again soon. For Channel 14 News, I'm Rebecca Vaughn. Campus students and the surrounding community are excited to finally welcome Chick-fil-A to Waynesburg. Rachel Pellegrino has more. Chick-fil-A has officially moved into Waynesburg. After months of delay, the doors of Chick-fil-A are finally open to the community. Students and faculty are filled with utter excitement. Thrilled, exhilarated, uh, relief. Uh, it, you know, this was a long time in the making. 
Due to COVID-19 and other circumstances, the project, which was supposed to be completed by spring 2021, didn't reach fruition until this semester. Waynesburg University President Douglas Lee said the opening of the restaurant brings a positive start to the new school year. It feels like we've run a marathon um, through this pandemic, and it's wonderful to have Chick-fil-A finally open and our students able to enjoy it. Reporting for WCTV, I'm Rachel Pellegrino. Waynesburg University's SAB hosted an outdoor movie night last Friday. Brock Owens has more on the event. Friday night, Johnson Commons was a popular place to be because of the school year's first outdoor movie night showing Jumanji the next level. The student activity board members had high hopes coming into the event. In past years, we've had great turnouts and we expect the same for this one. But they weren't the only ones who set the bar high. Expectations are the movie's going to be good, snacks are going to be nice, and I'm going to be here with the student body just having some fun. But the question is, did it live up to the hype? I think it was a really great outcome, especially since it's a holiday weekend. We didn't really expect a lot of students to come, but we had around 40-ish plus students come to this event, which is amazing, especially it being a Friday night. And the turnout was more than we could have expected. And is it student approved? It was better than what I expected it to be. I thought the movie wasn't going to be as good as it was, and it was nice to have free popcorn and candy. I've never been to one before, so it was a whole new experience, but it was a lot of fun. But if you miss the event this time, don't worry, because will it be back? Oh yeah, of course. This is one of our better events. You could say this event was at another level. Reporting for WCTV, I'm Brock Owens. That's all we have for campus and region news, and when we come back, we'll have news from around the nation. You're watching WCTV, where we aim to bring you the best local coverage of what you care about most. Everything from local businesses to hometown sports and the latest weather. We're keeping up to date with what you need to know about issues that affect our campus and our community. We're telling the stories that matter, celebrating our past, our future, and our potential. So tune in for all the latest buzz right here on WCTV Channel 14, Waynesburg. One week after Ida's first made landfall, and the exact death toll is still unknown. While some in Northeast hold out for hope that they're still missing in, for those still missing in floodwaters, more than half a million customers in Louisiana are still without power. And it could be weeks more before it's restored. Mandy Gaither has the latest on Ida's continuing impact. Picking up the pieces. If you drive around Queens, it looks like a bomb went off. One week after Hurricane Ida first made landfall, killing more than a dozen people in Louisiana and Mississippi and causing widespread flooding half a nation away, those in the storm's path still reeling. Everybody's personal belongings are out on the street. And we've seen what it looks like down south after a hurricane. This is what Queens looks like today. It's horrible. In the Northeast, the full impact still unknown after Ida unleashed devastating floods. Dozens dead in at least six states, more than two dozen in New Jersey alone. The last four days uh, have been so devastating to so many families with more than 130 properties damaged, 35 completely destroyed, families uprooted, infrastructure you know, affected, poles down. In Louisiana, some of the hardest hit areas still feeling the heat with no power. We know there are a lot of people out there who are in fact hurting. Please uh, take advantage of cooling shelters if you can. Uh, run your generators if you have them, but do it safely. In some areas of the Bayou State, it could be weeks before all power is restored. I'm Mandy Gaither reporting. This week, President Joe Biden is expected to travel to New Jersey and New York to see the widespread storm damage firsthand. It will be his second trip to survey damage, visiting Louisiana on Friday. Many Americans are facing a new financial challenge. The helping hand from the U.S. government was aiding millions of households affected by the COVID-19 pandemic is coming to an end. John Loring reports. The first weekend in September is bringing new challenges to at least seven and a half million Americans. Sleeplessness, the 
it's a lot. My inner voice is me yelling and screaming, trying to like, be like, what, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do. The COVID-19 pandemic unemployment benefits are expiring in the 26 states that were still handing them out. And while many companies say they're trying to fill positions with incentives like signing bonuses, they're often having trouble getting takers. Yeah, there are any number of jobs that I could go out and do, but not all of them can support me. In part because of health-related concerns. We're still in a pandemic. The idea of being close to hundreds of strangers a day, even while being vaccinated, that's not something that appeals to me in any way. Cutting unemployment benefits hasn't always resulted in sizable job growth this year. According to data from April to July, the states that ended federal benefits early saw just under a point in growth, while those that kept the benefits saw nearly twice as much. This comes on the heels of a disappointing monthly jobs report that showed the U.S. adding the least amount of positions since January. You've got COVID resurgence, which has affected the, you know, translated to bad job numbers, Afghanistan, fires, hurricanes. That's a lot all at one time. I'm John Lawrence reporting. The U.S. economy is still 5.3 million jobs below where it was in February of 2020, just before COVID-19 was declared a pandemic. 41 Afghan evacuees arrived at, to the UAE from Tajikistan on Monday, among them members of the Afghan girls cycling and robotics teams, as well as other human rights activists and their families. The evacuees are being hosted temporarily at the Emirates humanitarian city in Abu Dhabi, where they will be, quote, received high quality housing, sanitation, health and food services to ensure their welfare, and quote, according to the UAE Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation statement. The evacuation process was facilitated by an Israeli NGO, Israid, which coordinated the Afghan evacuees' entry into Tajikistan from Kabul and onward departure to the UAE. According to Yatam Politzer, CEO of Israid, the evacuation operation is the first joint humanitarian mission between the UAE and Israel. Pulitzer tells CNN that his organization will continue to provide the evacuees with long-term trauma support. The UAE has evacuated almost 40,000 Afghans since the beginning of August, according to the Mofaik statement, adding that nearly 9,000 evacuees are currently hosted in Abu Dhabi. Authorities in Colorado are investigating the death of a six-year-old girl at an amusement park in Glenwood Springs. The child was fatally injured Sunday while on a ride at Glenwood Caverns Adventure Park. According to the county, Gar Garfield County Coroner's Office, the accident happened on the park's haunted mine drop. The ride is billed on the park's website as the world's first drop ride to go underground. Details of what happened and the nature of the girl's injuries have not been released. An autopsy is scheduled for this week. Glenwood Caverns Adventure Park said it will be closed until Wednesday. Texas Governor Greg Abbott is expected to sign an election overhaul bill into law Tuesday. It comes from just one week after the bill was sent to his desk by the state legislator. The bill adds new restrictions and criminal penalties to the voting process in Texas. Its passage follows a dramatic move by Democratic state lawmakers to delay the measure. They fled Texas for weeks to prevent the House from having the quorum necessary to vote on the bill. Other states, including Florida and Georgia, have enacted similar bills, all, pa all based on Donald Trump's claim that the 2020 election was fraudulent. There was no evidence of widespread voter fraud in Texas or anywhere else. Democrats say the bill is meant to benefit Republicans because the restrictions largely impact people who tend to vote for Democrats. That includes minorities and people with disabilities. The largest Confederate statue remaining in the United States will come down on Wednesday. Virginia state officials say the removal of the statue of Robert E. Lee standing on Monument Avenue in Richmond was authorized by all three branches of government. The statue was installed back in 1890. Governor Ralph Northam offered it to be removed in June of 2020. However, legal challenges delayed it until the Supreme Court of Virginia ruled in favor of its removal. Officials say the 40-foot granite pedestal will stay for now. Its final home will be determined by a community-driven effort to reimagine Monument Avenue. About the removal, Government Northam said, quote, This is an important step in showing who we are and what we value as common wealth, end quote. The statue will be placed in storage until a decision is made on its new home. 
U.S. Navy officials are identifying the five service members who died in a helicopter crash off the California coast. The five sailors were declared dead Saturday following the crash near San Diego, about 50 miles off the coast. It happened during a routine flight operation Tuesday. On Sunday, the Navy identified those killed as Lieutenant Bradley Foster, Lieutenant Paul Fridley, Naval Air Crewman 2nd Class James Berriak, Hospital Corpsman 2nd Class Sarah Burns, and Hospital Corpsman 3rd Class Bailey Tucker. Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Mike Gilday said, quote, We stand alongside their families, loved ones, and shipmates who grieve, end quote. One crew member survived the crash and was rescued. The helicopter was based on the aircraft carrier USS Abraham Lincoln. The Navy said the incident is under investigation. The former Minnesota police officer who shot and killed Dante Wright is facing more serious charges after a review of the case. Former Brooklyn Center officer Kimberly Potter was already facing a count of second-degree manslaughter. Thursday, Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison added an upgraded charge of first-degree manslaughter to the existing account. The officer shot shot Wright, who was on arms in an incident that was recorded on police body camera video when it happened April 11th. Potter claims it was an accident, saying she thought she had a taser in her hand rather than her service weapon when she pulled the trigger. Attorneys for Potter had previously indicated in a court filing that they anticipated an additional charge would be filed. A park in St. Louis, Missouri is honoring victims of 9-11 ahead of the 20th anniversary. Take a look. Volunteers put up more than 7,000 flags in Forest Park. That's one flag for each American service member and first responder who has died since 9-11. Then 13 service members killed in the terrorist attack in Kabul last week are among those being remembered. Each flag includes dog tags and the picture of a service member killed in wartime. The display is nearly 11 miles of flag rows across 10 acres. Volunteers are helping families and friends find specific heroes based on the year of the death. American Heartland Remembers is the group that organizes the annual event. It's set to run through September 12th. Vice President Kamala Harris will campaign with California Governor Gavin Newsom in the Bay Area on Wednesday. The vice president is returning to her home state to fight the recall effort against the Democratic governor before the September 14th vote. Harris had been scheduled to campaign with Newsom last month, but canceled her rally after the terrorist attack that killed 13 U.S. service members in Afghanistan. Meanwhile, Governor Newsom is campaigning with Senator Elizabeth Warren Saturday in Los Angeles in an effort to energize Democratic voters. The White House has said President Joe Biden also intends to campaign for Newsom, but the exact timing hasn't officially been announced. That's all for national news. When we come back, we'll have Tanner Saprowski with Business and Entertainment. But first, we have Rachel Pellegrino outside with a brief weather update. Rachel? I'm Rachel Pellegrino, Channel 14 News. Labor Day weekend is behind us, which means summer is officially over and fall has begun. Cooler temperatures, pumpkin spice lattes, and my full weather forecasts are ahead of us. Stay tuned for more on Channel 14 News. Hello, I'm Terrence Saprosky here with your business and entertainment update. The actor best known for his role as Omar Little on HBO's The Wire has died. Michael K. Williams was found dead Monday in his penthouse apartment in Brooklyn, New York. Investigators say drug paraphernalia was found near his body.
The 54-year-old New York City native most recently appeared in HBO's Lovecraft Country in the series F is for Family. Williams was next slated to co-star in Sony's George Foreman biopic. Williams was a five-time Emmy nominee. He was also the winner of SAG Award for Best Ensemble along with the cast of Boardwalk Empire. Chrissy Teigen is celebrating a milestone. The author and TV personality posted on Instagram over the weekend that she's been sober for 50 days. She said this is her longest sobriety streak yet, after a few hiccups over the past year. Teigen says alcohol doesn't serve her in any way and she is unsure if she will ever drink again. Teigen has stepped back a bit from social media as she grapples with depression following a miscarriage and revelations that she trolled people online in the past. She has apologized publicly for her previous behavior. As the warm days of summer wind down, the kids head back to school and those last summer vacations come to an end, there's something to look forward to this September. End of season sales. In today's Consumer Watch, Jen Sullivan has rounded up some of the best discounted items to get your hands on this month. Labor Day marks the unofficial end of summer, but also a great month to snag some amazing deals. According to Consumer Reports, now is a great time to get items to improve your home. Great news if you love to host weekend football parties. You can score big on outdoor grills and TVs right now. And keep that yard looking nice for your guests with discounts on lawnmowers, leaf blowers, and even chainsaws. Consumer Reports indicates right now is also a great time to upgrade your kitchen before those holiday meals. Major household appliances typically drop in price in September. But beware, the publication says there could be fewer discounts on these larger pieces this year due to COVID-related supply chain issues. Finally, if you're looking for a new cell phone, now might be a good time. And if the reports are true, Apple could drop the iPhone 13 this month, making all older models cheaper. No matter what you're after, it's never too early to get those holiday gifts or stock up for next summer. For today's Consumer Watch, I'm Jen Sullivan. Two movies in today's entertainment spotlight, a fairy tale and a film set in a turbulent reality. Here's David Daniel with the Hollywood Minute. <gasps> wow, they're beautiful. When writer-director Kay what? Cannon went to persuade Camila Cabello to star in Cinderella, she took along a certain prop. <laughs> and everything. She uh, brought a glass slipper. I had found a, a modern looking glass slipper on Etsy. <laughs> and I was... I was uh, gonna give it to her and I told the producers what I was gonna do and they were like, don't, don't do that, that's weird. I pull out the slipper and I'm like, <laughs> do you like it? Do you, do you, like, do you like me? Um, are we doing this together? Any way you can make them more comfortable. No. But your magic. Women's shoes are as they are. Even magic has its limits. Mm. Cinderella is now streaming on Amazon Prime. Are we gonna have to leave Belfast? We'll fight this together. This is it. This is what? This is war. This is the first trailer for writer-director Kenneth Branagh's Belfast, about a family living through the troubles in that city in the late 1960s. Belfast arrives in theaters November 12th. In Hollywood, I'm David Dan. Up next, we have Bruce Davidson with your Waynesburg Sports Update, so stick around. <laughs> Zuzik into the end zone, almost untouched. The middle back out to Delaney, three ball. How about, yes. Cuts up inside, into the end zone. Touchdown, Trenton Carter. Hello there, I'm Bruce Davidson with your Waynesburg Sports Update. It was a busy first week of September for Waynesburg Athletics, starting off with both the men's and women's cross-country teams placing third in the Chatham Cougar Challenge last Wednesday. Two freshmen placed top 15 for the Waynesburg men, with Luke Weissel finishing 12th and Nolan Curran ending up in 14th. In the women's field, Jackets senior Gloria Reed topped the team and all PAC runners with a fifth place result. Then on Friday, both teams followed up with a trip to Westminster for the Fisher Invitational. The men's team placed 5th out of 8, and the women's team 4th out of 9. 
For the men's sophomore Andrew Casper took home a 10th place finish and junior Jack Coakley wound up in 20th. Three members of the women's team grabbed top 20 spots. Sophomores Gabrielle Reefsnyder and Jula Anderson as well as senior Gloria Reed, with Reed leading the charge in a 7th place effort. Next up for both squads, our return to Pittsburgh as Chatham hosts the PAC preview on Friday. The Waynesburg volleyball team opened up their season with a 3-0 win over LaRoche on Wednesday night. Freshman Michaela Osborne led the way with 8 kills and 3 aces in the game. The Jackets went on to then split day one of the Bearcat Challenge in St. Vincent on Friday, falling to Allegheny, then defeating Pitt-Greensburg both by scores of 3-0. In the win over Pitt-Greensburg, junior Kayla Stohan picked up 9 kills with 1 ace and 2 blocks. Waynesburg would unfortunately drop both day two games on Saturday, losing 3-2 against Pitt-Bradford and 3-0 against Hiram. The Waynesburg women's soccer team came up just short by a score of 2-1 Saturday at John F. Wiley Stadium versus Mount Union. Despite being outshot 26-11, Waynesburg kept the Purple Raiders honest throughout the day, and freshman Haley Johnson picked up her first collegiate goal with Waynesburg's only marker in the game. Junior goalkeeper Autumn Blair made seven saves in the contest. The Lady Jackets' next matchup will be Tuesday at home against LaRoche at 7 o'clock. Meanwhile, the men's team took their game at Allegheny to double overtime after falling behind 2-0. Senior Daniel Hott notched the first Jackets goal, and freshman Connor Jacobs tied the game late in the second half. It was a valiant rally, but the Gators prevailed with the first shot of overtime number two besting freshman goalkeeper Michael Frankus, and Allegheny hanging on by a final score of 3-2. The men's soccer team will host LaRoche Wednesday at 7. Yellow Jacket football did not start quite to plan Saturday in Muskingum, where Waynesburg traveled to face the Fighting Muskies. The Jackets trailed 42-0 at the half before ending with the final score 49-6 in favor of Muskingum. Week 2 will see the debut of four Waynesburg teams starting with women's tennis. The Jacket Rackets open up Wednesday at home against Pitt Greensburg, then travel to Geneva Thursday before ending the week at home against Washington and Jefferson on Sunday. Men's golf hits the links for the first time this Thursday at the Grove City Invitational, with the women's golf team taking on the same challenging Grove City Country Club two days later on Saturday. And last to launch their season is the men's tennis team at St. Vincent on Saturday. Saturday also marks the return of the Waynesburg University Sports Network when the Yellow Jacket football team has their home opener against the Case Western Spartans. Kickoff is at 1 o'clock. And you can see it live right here on Channel 14 and streaming on the WUDP YouTube page. The game will also be broadcast with radio coverage on 99.5 The Hive, WCYJFM. To keep up with all university athletics, go to waynesburgsports.com for the latest schedules. And head on over to the yellowjacket.org for game recaps, player and coach features, and much more. After the break, Rachel Pellegrino has your Waynesburg Weekly Weather Outlook. Stay tuned. Hello, I'm Rachel Pellegrino with your Channel 14 weather report. Waynesburg is heading into the third week of classes and the weather is showing a bright semester ahead. Here is what we can expect for the rest of the week. It is currently 79 degrees outside in Waynesburg, Pennsylvania with partly cloudy skies. As we head into tonight, temperatures will drop as low as 63 degrees. 
Tomorrow will be a high of 74, the low 55, and we can expect showers throughout the day. Don't worry, these showers won't be here long. The skies will clear up for the rest of the week, bringing Waynesburg's mild temperatures and lots of sunshine. Thursday will bring partly cloudy skies with a high of 74 and a low of 52. We'll be experiencing similar temperatures on Friday with a high of 74 and low of 51. Then, as we head into the weekend, the temperatures will begin to rise into the 80s, making it a perfect weekend to spend outdoors. Saturday will have a high of 79 and a low of 60, and Sunday will bring a high of 82 and low of 63. The warm temperatures will continue into next week with a high of 83 on Monday and a low of 62. It looks like Monday, however, will be our last sunny day of the week. Tuesday will bring scattered thunderstorms with a high of 83 and a low of 62. Rain showers will continue throughout next week. I'm Rachel Pellegrino, and this has been your 7-day forecast. Thank you very much, Rachel, and we have hit the third week of classes here at Waynesburg University. How's your schedule been, Gwen? My schedule's been good. I get all my classes done in the morning, so I'm done around 12, so that's nice. I'm definitely enjoying my classes this year. A lot are testing me to do my best, so I'm excited to see how the semester goes. Absolutely. My classes have been more scheduled out, more uh, paced this year, but things are starting to pick up here in the third week. But unfortunately, that's all the time we have here on Channel 14. I'm Caleb Yager. And I'm Gwen Napier. Thank you, and have a great night. This has been a production of Waynesburg Community Television.